The Bible says we will judge angels, and Satan is a falling angel. We will judge angels. I believe we will be able to say he is guilty. He's guilty of stealing my joy, guilty of trying to rob my family, guilty of bringing addiction into my children. I profess him guilty. While the world is coming out of the closet, the church is hiding in the closet because we're afraid to clean out our closet. But righteousness and integrity is able to stand flat-footed with confidence and say, that's wrong, and I'm not going to stand for it. So I've tried to say this three times. I'm going to say it. I have a tree in my yard. <laughs> Two trees that I had cut down. They were right up against my house, big water oak trees. And so I had to have them cut down. I had them cut down, I don't know, whenever I had a little bit of money to pay to have those trees cut down because that ain't cheap. And I had these two trees cut down, and they were not able to grind the stumps right then. And so the stumps remained. I've got two stumps that are about this big, and they're right beside each other, two of them. Well, it's in an area of my house that I don't go to much. It's fenced off. It's over there on the side, and it's got a separate fence on the side. I don't go through that area of my yard much. I mean, I go through there, you know, once a year or so, but not much. <laughs> I go through there pretty often, but I don't have a reason to go to that side of my house much. So I walked over there the other day, and when I did, I had to, I was doing something to my air conditioner drain, and when I walked in there, I realized there were these two big bushes about this tall. And I'm like, I don't remember those bushes. And then I got to looking and I realized what had happened because I didn't have the stumps grinded up. These, these things had popped up out of the stump and it created a bush about that big where life was still in the root system of the tree. Now, I didn't have a 30-foot tree anymore, but I, there was still life down in the ground. The roots were still producing something that was still creating a nuisance. So then I had to cut all of that stuff out, all that brush that had grown, so that I can get somebody in to grind the stump up because when I get the stump out of the ground and I deal with the root system, then I can kill that thing so that it won't grow back up again. And so we can deal with all of the, all of the things that we see, all of these crazy, we, we can deal with all that. Target can move it from the front of the store to the back of the store. And, and, and all of the other things. You know, I, I told somebody the other day, it seems to me like Bud Light drinkers have been more vocal and effective than the church. Come on, somebody. Because, as a matter of fact, Tuesday, I won't name the organization, but the lady from, the, I can't say that either. The lady that sent us the email, that sent me an email and asked us to be there, is deeply connected to... A, a municipal city, <laughs> and they, they sent us this email and said, would you please be there? We reached out to this organization, to this denomination, and they refused to attend. I said, well, the Church of God's going to show up with bells on. We got to get to the root. And so I could talk today and I could show you pictures of drag queens and, you know, I would be, I, I would be preaching to the choir. We're all, we, all, that upsets all of us, drag, drag queens reading to our children. Yeah, I could preach about that, but everybody in here, I, I don't think there's anybody in here that would support that. So I would be preaching for the applause of the gallery if I did that. I could show you the pictures. I, I started to do that. I could show you all of the news reports of the things happening. I could show you the cannon down, downtown that they painted rainbow colors and the city paid for that. And I could get everybody in here stirred up because I don't think anybody in here would support such a thing. I could talk about the radical. I, I, could, I could huck and buck and talk about the sins of, of, of fornication and the LGBTQ community and the things. I could do all that and stir us up. As I began to pray and seek God for how to address this, I heard the Holy Spirit say, go to the root of the problem because the root of pride is in every one of us. We're born with it. 
And until we grind it out of our lives, it's going to continue to put sprouts up. It may not manifest itself in the way that, that, that there will be those this month celebrating pride. But let me talk about pride. If you have your Bibles this morning, go to the book of Proverbs 16 and then verse 18. Proverbs 16 and verse 18. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. We're going to be speaking today on the perils of pride. Let me just ask this as you're turning. How many of you in this room have a problem with pride? Just lift your hand. All right. I'm going to be preaching to y'all, but I'm, I'm mostly going to be preaching to those that didn't lift their hand. In all seriousness, pride is a problem that we all wrestle with. And if you don't realize you wrestle with it, then you really need to hear this message today. And those that think they don't have it probably have more of it than anybody that lifted their hand. Here's what the Bible says. Proverbs 16 and 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. There is a sin, a very dangerous sin, that in my estimation and understanding, it is doing more to hold back revival than any other sin. This sin's doing more to destroy homes than any other sin. It's doing more to ruin this nation than any other sin. It's causing more Christians to live in failure and to live in defeat than any other sin. And that is filling hell more than any other sin, and frankly, it is the sin of pride. I may give you, I want to give you this morning five things that, that pride will do to absolutely ruin and devastate your life. Number one is this, and I'm going to try to preach through these quickly because I've preached too long the last two weeks. Number one is this, pride defies God. Pride defies God. Pride is a fist in the face of God. Now, we're going to be in the book of Proverbs throughout this whole message, and I intentionally, I didn't give Jessica all the scriptures because I'm going to go through a lot of scriptures. But if you'll keep your Bible open to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs is the book of what? Somebody help me. Wisdom. It's filled with wisdom. It's nugget after nugget after nugget after nugget of wisdom. And so I want to look to the book of wisdom written by the wisest man that ever lived, and I want to see what the book of wisdom says about pride. So we're going to be all in the book of Proverbs. And so if you want to just stay there in Proverbs, we're going to go back and forth. But the book of Proverbs gives us some wonderful life lessons. Look at one of them in Proverbs 6, verse 16 through 19. I think we do have this one. It says, these, I'm giving you time to get there, so I'm going to put this one on the screen. These Six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. Number one, pride. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that are swift and running to evil. A false witness who speaks lies. And one who sows discord among the brethren. Now we preach that sin is sin. It doesn't matter what sin is. But God says there's seven that I hate. And he lists what some call the seven cardinal sins or the, 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 seven, the seven fatal sins. And, and those are the seven things that God hates. And number one on that parade uh, list, God's hate parade, is pride. A proud look. So why does God hate pride? Well, look at Proverbs 16 and verse 5. It says, everyone that is proud, proud in heart is an abomination unto God. That's twice he said that. An abomination. Does that sound familiar? Because God calls these sexual sins that I listed a moment ago, he calls them an abominable abomination sin. You see how the people, whoever, whoever came up with the idea that they, they would attach the word pride to these, these sins, sexual sins, 
that we call LGBTQ+, LGBTQA+. And there's something else added to it now. But those sexual sins that the Bible calls fornication, the Bible calls it sin, all of those, isn't it amazing that the word that is attached to that throughout this entire month in particular is the word pride, the thing that God calls an abomination. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. That's some strong language, y'all. Pride is an abomination unto the Lord. If you're proud, you are abominable to the Lord. Why does God hate pride so much? Listen, it was pride that created the devil. It was pride that turned a lovely angel named Lucifer, the son of the morning, into Satan, the father of the night. The national religion of Satan's kingdom is pride. That's what the kingdom of Satan is built upon, pride. No wonder pride defies God. Friend, look, look at the heartache, look at the sorrow, look at the tears, all, all the wars and strife and pain and agony and shame, and you can point at all of it and say pride did that. Pride's what brought wars on. Pride's what causes divorce. Pride is what causes church splits. Pride is what causes division in the home among fathers and sons and mothers and daughters. Pride has wrecked the human race. It defies God. And I said we're going to stay in Proverbs, but here's an ancillary scripture that, that you can't pass up. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5, the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 5, God resists the proud. Think about that. God, coming to you today with a need, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Now, grace is both the desire and the ability to do the will of God. And how many understand we all need the grace of God? All of us. But grace and pride are antithetical. They're opposites. Grace and pride are completely opposite. God resists the proud. It's not that God merely doesn't help the proud, but God lines himself up in battle against the proud. God, God defiles. He pushes back the proud. He resists the proud. Is that what you want God to do to you? Do you want God to literally resist you? Boy, it's quiet up in here. That means I'm preaching. 1 Peter 5, 5, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That's the first thing pride will do to destroy your life. Pride defies God. Number two, not only does pride defy God, but pride defiles man. Pride defiles man. Pride is, it comes out of the heart, and it defiles the very heart of man. And the seed of pride is the heart. Proverbs 16 and verse 5 speaks of, it says, everyone that is proud in heart, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination unto the Lord. And then look at Proverbs 21 and verse 4. It says, a high look, a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is sin. That is, a man who would plow his field. That's what he's saying here. A man that would plow his field without giving God thanks for the sun and for the rain and for the soil and the germinating qualities. He's proud. A man that would put his effort in and not give God glory for all of the things that causes it to grow. A man and a woman that would live life and walk through life and not give God the glory for it all is a proud man and a proud woman. He's self-sufficient. And so the Bible says that if you have pride, even when you're plowing a field, it is sin. It just defiles man. So where does this pride come from? Well, I said it earlier, we're just born with it. It kind of comes naturally. You know, pride comes out of the heart. Mark 7, 21 says, For from within, out of the heart of man, proceeds evil thoughts, 
adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride. All of that comes out of the heart. Little children were born with pride in their heart. You don't believe it? Take a little child, surround him with toys more than he needs. He's not playing with any of them. Let another mother bring her little baby in there and put them on the floor, and that little baby go over there and get one of those toys and watch your baby, your sweet little baby. He'll leave the toys he's playing with, go over there and bop that other kid in the head with that toy and say, mine. Come on, somebody. Children are born with pride and ego and selfishness in their heart. Not my baby. Yeah, your baby. I hate to tell you, folks, but it's true. It comes out of the heart. You think those things are learned? You think they're developed? No, no, no. You've got to develop it the other way. You don't, te- you don't have to teach a kid how to be jealous. You don't have to teach a kid how to have pride. You don't have to teach a kid to be disrespectful. You have to teach a child to be respectful. You have to teach a child not to have pride. You have to teach a child to, to, to do the right things because instinctively, if you let a child go its own way, they will instinctively, because of the root of sin that abides in us, they'll instinctively produce the things that sin produces. Jesus said they come out of the heart, and so pride defies God, pride defiles man, and that's the reason every person in this building, if he's not been saved or she's not been saved, needs to be saved and born again because when we get born again, that's the first time that we're born with a nature that does not include pride. I hope you understand that. Number three, Pride divides society. We're talking about five things that pride's going to do to you. Number three, it divides society. It defies God, it defiles man, and it divides, divides society. I'm going to tell you something. You may disagree with me for a moment. You've got a right to be wrong. <laughs> that was a little pride come out of me right there. But there, there has never, for those that don't know me, that was just humor, that was just a joke. But there has never been an argument. There has never been a war. There's never been a divorce. There's never been a church split that pride was not the major factor in it. Yeah. Think about it. Let me say that again. There's never been an argument. There's never been a war. There's never been a divorce. There's never been a church split where pride was not the major Factor. You say, Pastor, can you prove that? Yep. If I couldn't prove it, I wouldn't say it. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10 says, Only by pride comes contention. Only by pride comes contention. Only by pride comes contention. Proverbs 28, 25 says, He that is of a proud heart stirs. Let me read it in the King James. That's how I typed it out. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up contention. That's obvious. If God resists the proud, then the proud man is out of fellowship with God. And any man, any woman, any boy, any girl that is out of fellowship with God is going to be out of fellowship with people. Because you got to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second one is like it. you got to love your neighbor as yourself. And if you're out of fellowship with God, you're out of fellowship with his people. Amen. And it follows as night follows the day. And so pride divides society. Have you ever gotten into a discussion with your wife? By discussion, I mean the neighbors can hear. I call it intense moments of fellowship. You know... <laughs> So what's that all about? When that happens, what's it all about? It's about pride. I'm about to bother somebody right here. Your arguments are about pride. The arguments that you have with your mate, your wife, your husband, are ego versus ego. There are no problems my wife's not even here today. She's 500 miles away, so I can preach. 
There are no problems. No, I can't. She's watching. There are no problems too big to be solved. There's just people too small to solve them. Come on, somebody. Well, I've had people come to me, well, we just can't get along. Well, why don't you try? Well, we've tried. Well, why don't you try harder? Well, we just, it seems like we just, we, it's, it's not like it was when we first got married. I'm like, hello? Come on, somebody. There ain't nothing the same. I just don't love her anymore. How long have you been married? 30 years. Well, we're just, I just don't love them anymore. Seriously. You can't have a dog for two years and not love that dog. A goldfish. I was driving through the car wash the other day, and I was in Kim's car. And I had our grandkids, and Titus was in the back. And we're just going through the car wash, and, and he'd not, they'd not ridden that car. So I like Nana's car. And I'm like, I do too. I kind of like it. And he said, I like it. But he said, you remember that other car? Because she had a car that had, like, these screens on the back of the seats. So he was really attached to those because you had video screens on the back of the seats. I said, you remember that car? And he said, I love that car, too. He said, it had those screens back there. I said, yeah, I remember that, too. But, you know, we just traded. And so we're going through the car wash, didn't say anything for a little bit. And I look in the rearview mirror, and Titus, he's five years old. He's, oh. I'm like, Titus, what are you crying for? I said, do you think about that car? He said, yeah, I have so many memories. <laughs> Five years old with so many memories. <laughs> if you'll put the problem out in the middle and you'll attack the problem rather than one another, then you can solve the problem. But we're not trying to solve the problem. We're not trying to solve the problem. We're just trying to stand our ground. Come on, somebody. Amen. We're not trying. We're trying to win the argument. Amen. And you know it's true, and, 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 and that is pride. Only by pride comes contention. Listen, when Kim and I have an intense moment of fellowship, we have a disagreement. What happens is both of us saw up a little bit. I go away. I lick my wounds a while, and I saw a while, and I sulk a while, and I try to pray a while. And then finally, I stop and I say, okay, let's analyze this. And do you know what the problem is? 99.9% .9 of the time, my pride. My pride. That's it. God says, David, you're proud. Doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. Come on. I might be right, but I'm still the problem. Come on. It's not that I'm right or wrong. It's that that whole discussion that elevated was because of my pride. And I might be right, but I'm still the problem because of my attitude, which is rooted in pride. And, boy, it hurts. And it feels so good at the same time to go and say, I'm sorry. I was r -r -r wrong. And when it's and 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 were it not for the grace of God, listen, I know me. Were it not for the grace of God, I couldn't do that. Were it not for the grace of God, I would argue. I mean, it's down in me. It's rooted deep in the Smith genes. I would argue till the sun went down if it were not for the grace of God that says you're proud and you need to fix that before the sun goes down. Come on, somebody, give God praise for grace. So I'll ask you, you don't have to lift your hands. Or is there any contention in your home? Come on, let me go get the kids and interview them. Ask them that same question. Is there any contention in your home? I wonder if, I wonder if one of your children could, could testify any contention in your home. Put it down big. Put it down plain. Put it down straight. Pride is the issue. Only by pride comes contention. Again, I want to remind you that the problem is ego against ego. And if you take ego off the throne and put Jesus Christ on the throne of your life and your wife or your husband takes ego off the throne and enthrones Jesus Christ in their life, then, then the Jesus in her is not going to fight the Jesus in you and the Jesus in you is not going to argue with the Jesus and her. I just saved a bunch of marriage issues right there. No counseling appointments needed. 
Pride is the chief cause of misery in society. What's the problem between races? What caused all the social unrest in 2020? Pride. Pride. The Pride boys. Come on, it's on every, it's everywhere. Pride, seriously? We want to name and associate ourselves with pride? It's quiet up in here. No matter what color you are, that's the problem. And God is dead set against it. Now, number four, because I'll get stuck right there and really get in trouble. Number four, here's the fourth thing that pride does. Number four, pride dishonors life. Let me tell you a great irony. Do you know what the proud person is wanting? Do you know what the proud person really is seeking? Whoever attaches himself to this word, listen to their, listen to their language. Do you know what they're seeking? They're seeking honor. They're seeking to be elevated. They're seeking esteem. They're seeking praise. We want a whole month named after us. Jacob asked a good question the other day. He said, why? And this is him coming from his country, his culture. We were sitting at lunch one day, and, and we were talking about, it was this week, and we were talking about this. And, and he asked this question. He said, why do we have, because he understood last Sunday we celebrated Memorial Day. That's an American thing. He said, why do we celebrate Memorial Day and Pride Month? That's a pretty good question. And that's the very thing that he wants, Satan wants. And what does he get through pride? Dishonor. Pride dishonors life. Proverbs 11.2, when pride comes, then comes shame. Does anybody here want shame? No. See, what the person what, what pride, people with pride, what they're wanting, they're wanting recognition, they want honor, they want esteem, they want to be lifted up, they want to be exalted. But what, that's what they want. They don't want shame, they want honor, but they don't get it. Put down Proverbs 15, 33. Here's what it says. The fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and before honor is humility. I hope y'all are getting this message. Look at Proverbs 18, 12. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Put this one down. Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride shall bring him low. If it's not ironical, I say that the proud man, or it is ironical, that the proud man wants to be praised, petted, vaunted, honored, recognized, and the very thing he wants is the very thing that he loses the admiration of others. And what he ends up with, the proud person always ends up not with admiration, but contempt. Somebody said, conceit is a disease that makes everybody sick except the one who has it. And the reality is nobody's more sick than the one who has it. But the truth of the matter is, he's the sickest of them all. Now, Jesus taught us very clearly and very plainly that the way up is down and the way down is up. Right? Remember I told you that God hates pride? It's number one on his list. Why does God hate pride? Let me tell you how the devil became the devil. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you from Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 13. And God's speaking to Lucifer. He says, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend, uh, I will ascend into heaven. I want you to listen to the to the, the perpendicular pronoun right there. Listen, watch this. I will ascend into heaven. This is the scripture. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend up above the clouds of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shall be brought down to hell, the Bible says, to the sides of the pit, and they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee. That is, they're going to have to squint in order to even see you. God said, Satan says, I will arise. I will ascend. I've always said in the church there is, there, there's, only, there's only one difference between ruin and run, and it's I. 
If I can't run it, I'll ruin it. Pride. What's this? He says, and conquer. It says, they're going to have to squint in order to even see you. And consider, the, he, the Bible says, this saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake the kingdoms? And here is Satan saying, I'm going to be like the Most High. I'm going up, 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 up. That's what the Scripture says. I, 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 I. And God says, no, you're going down, 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 down. Is that you, Satan? I think I see that speck right there. Come on, somebody. See, we've exalted Satan like he's some big threat. Greater is he who's within you than he that's in the world. But watch. <laughs> One day we'll look down and we'll say, is that the devil? I can barely see him. Amen. That's him. That's him. What is our Lord saying? Our Lord is saying, let this mind be in you, watch this, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but watch, let us be, he said, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant. He humbled himself in the form of a servant. And God hath highly given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Satan said, I will exalt myself, and he was abased because up is down and down is up. So Satan said, I will exalt myself. I will ascend. I, I will go up, up, up. Jesus said, I'm willing to go down, down, down. And Satan, who said, I'll go up, was abased and kicked out of heaven. Jesus, who was willing to come down, down, down to a servant's level, the Bible says God therefore has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. Don't let this go past you this morning. You are going to be given in the days to come a greater position than Satan had before. For he fell. Oh, you didn't get that because I didn't hear an amen. Listen, you follow Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, listen to me. You follow Jesus Christ, and God is going to give you, his saints, a greater position than Satan had in heaven before he fell. The Bible says, watch this, the Bible says we will judge angels, and Satan is a falling angel. We will judge angels. I believe we will be able to say he is guilty. He's guilty of stealing my joy. Guilty of trying to rob my family. Guilty of bringing addiction into my children. I profess him guilty. And the Bible says he'll be thrown in a pit for it. Then he'll be thrown in the lake of fire and brimstone where he will burn forever and throughout all eternity. Amen. The very thing that people want, they lose. Pride dishonors life. Let me tell you a story. This is a make-believe story. Once there was a frog, as our musicians come. Once there was this frog in the cold mud of Minnesota. And he saw some Canadian geese, and he said, where are you guys going? And they said, uh, well, we're flying south for the winter. And the frog said, I want to go south. I've never been south. Where are you going, Alabama? He said, oh, i got to go to Alabama, roll tide. And they said, you don't have any wings. He said, I realize that, and it's a long way to hop. But he said, I've got an idea. He said, take this twig, and one of you geese, gooses, get, get one end of the stick, and another goose, get the other end of the stick. And he said, I'll grab a hold of the middle with my mouth. I'll chomp down on it, and you can fly. And I'll just kind of go with you. And I will take my mouth, grab that thing, hold on, you can fly me south. And they said, do you think it'll work? He said, let's try it. So this big Canadian goose over here and another Canadian goose over here, and they get a twig between them. The frog, he comes, he grasps on to the twig, grabs hold, and they're flying south. Gets over Indiana, and they're flying over these plains, cornfields. And a farmer looks up, and he sees that frog and that twig and those goose, those geese. <laughs> and he says, he says, man, 
And he said, that is a great idea. Wonder who thought of that. The frog says, I did. Here's the fifth thing. Pride destroys your soul. I'm going to preach on pride next week, but I just had to lay a foundation this week. This is my introduction. This is not really the message. This is the introduction to next week's sermon. Pride, my friends, populates hell. Pride populates hell. Pride ultimately destroys everything it controls. It's the road to ruin. Proverbs 15, 25 says, the Lord will destroy the house of the proud. Proverbs 16, 18, and 19, pride goes before destruction and the Holy Spirit before a fall. Pro Proverbs 18, 12, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty and before honor is humility. The seeds of destruction, eternal destruction are in pride. Listen, no one can be saved. Nobody. Nobody. I don't care how good you are, who your mom and daddy was, who grandma and them were. Nobody can be saved except by the blood of Jesus and the grace of God. Nobody. I don't care if you come to God with one sin or a million sins. Nobody can be saved without the grace of God. But the Bible says God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. That's why we don't, we don't talk. We don't, our language is different than it used to be. We don't kneel like we used to kneel. We don't bow like we used to bow. But the reason we get on our knees and pray is because we are humbling ourselves before the mighty hand of God. We're bowing to him. When we say, lift, our, lift your hands unto the Lord, it's more than just some Pentecostal programming. It's a surrender. Lord, I surrender everything to you. My pride, my vanity, my heart, my life. When I kneel, when a six foot two man kneels, I'm kneeling to God and saying, Lord, my life is yours. Everything, everything. In 53 years of life, every accomplishment, every victory, every success, every possession, Lord, it belongs to you. Listen. America, so, America is so proud to have a whole month to celebrate pride. Come on, America is so proud. Yet God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. It doesn't just say pray. It says humble themselves and pray. Seek my face. Turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. And I will heal their land. I've traveled to over 40 nations of this world. And there are beautiful places. There's beautiful countries. Beautiful scenery, beautiful people. And it's not pride to say that America is from my perspective of everything I've seen, America is the most blessed nation in the world. But folks, we are in decline. And it's not, I'm not getting political. It's not about directly who's in the White House or who's in Congress. All of those things are important. We should vote our convictions. The problem is we've got a nation that's become proud. We've got a generation that lives in pride and celebrates pride and exalts pride. Yet if my people, who are called by my name, Christians, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal their land. Would you stand with me all over this room? There are congregations that have families that are breaking apart. Why? Pride. Financial ruin. Some of you under the sound of my voice right now, either in this room or watching by television or by our platforms, some of you 
are right now in financial ruin. You can't have as many people together and that not be a case. Somebody right now, you don't know how you're going to make it through the week. You don't know how you're going to make it through the month. You know why? I'll tell you. Part of the reason is because your neighbors keep buying things you can't afford. And you think you have to stay up with them. Emotional ruin. If you're a proud person, if you're a proud person, your emotions are going to be very thin because you're, you're, you're going to be controlled by circumstances. If you don't have the right car, if you don't have the right clothes, if you don't have the right decorations, if you don't have the right this, or you don't have the right that, and emotionally, it's going to get to you. But, but folks, primarily, it is spiritual ruin and eternal ruin. Do you know the reason that some people cannot have their ministry blessed? I'm just going to preach this right here. I was, I was on standby to preach there was a speaker at a North Carolina, Eastern North Carolina camp meeting that was had a stroke. So the overseer called and said, Will you be, could you preach next week? Some of you guys that I call y'all a week in advance to teach or preach. He called me yesterday and said, If he can't make it, can you be there Monday? I'm like, in North Carolina, Monday morning? I said, How many times do I need to speak? He said, Seven. Seven? With one day's notice? What do you need me to speak on? Leadership. Seven lessons on leadership in one day's notice? Thankfully, the guy got healed. He's going to be there. I'm telling you, I prayed the prayer of faith, and the prayer of faith saved the sick. So I got a whole year to prepare now. You know the reason some, so I would have preached this if I'd been there. You know the reason some people cannot have their ministry blessed? Because they're too big for God to use. Do you know you can be too big for God to use? But you can never be too small for God to use. Come on, somebody. I'm closing. Pride destroys souls. Pride is filling hell. Help us. Remember the story I told you earlier about Jesus talking? I said this a couple weeks ago. Talking about two went to the temple to pray. One was a publican. Another was a Pharisee. The publicans were the IRS of that day. They were tax collectors, but they were very, very crooked. Not, well, kind of like the IRS, very dishonest. And besides, let's edit that out of there. I hadn't done my taxes yet. Beside, besides that, the Jews hated them because, because they worked for Rome. And, and Israel had been occupied by the Roman government and by Roman law. And so to say publicans in that day was like an... It, it was like a curse word, a word of condemnation and scorn. And so the publican went to, went to pray, and the Pharisee went to pray, and the Pharisee were the religious of the religious. I mean, they just, I mean, a Pharisee wouldn't even eat an egg that was laid on Saturday. Seriously. They wouldn't eat an egg that the chicken laid on Saturday. That, uh, if a mosquito was biting that Pharisee on Saturday, he wouldn't slap it because he couldn't go hunting on the Sabbath. Seriously. Now, and they still exist. These things still exist. If you go to Israel, there's a Shabbat elevator. Don't ever get in one of those. Because we stayed in a hotel years ago, my first trip to Israel. It was a 10-story hotel. And if you get in a Shabbat elevator, you get in the elevator and you don't touch anything. And it stops at every floor. Because you can't touch a button that's working on the Sabbath. If he, got a t if he got a tack in his shoe, he'd always pull it out before Saturday lest he be accused of carrying a burden on the Sabbath. <laughs> so religious, so religious were they. And, and this Pharisee is praying and he's, and the, pu and the publican, and, and, and then he's saying, Father God, the Bible says he prayed with himself. And that is God wasn't hearing his prayer, the Pharisee. He said, God, I thank you. I'm not like other men are. This is what the Pharisee said. God, I thank you I'm not like other men. In other words, he's saying, I'm glad I'm not like this publican. I'm glad I'm not like this person over here. I'm glad I'm not like this woman over there. And then he said, and I especially thank you I'm not like this publican. The Bible says a publican smote himself on the breast, and he would not even lift his eyes to heaven. And he prayed, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Actually, what he says is, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He's saying, I'm the chief of sinners. You know what Jesus said? Two men went to church that day. One went home dignified, and
and the other went home justified. And everybody in this building will go home one of two ways today. You'll either go home dignified, full of pride, or you'll go home justified, just as if I never sinned. Because I humbled myself before the mighty hand of God. And when you humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and you seek him and all his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. But if you seek after things and reject the God of your soul, you'll miss what God has for your future.